Mama, I want to start off by giving you your flowers. I really appreciate you. I'm really grateful for you. Um, you give me a lot of courage to take risks and do things that I feel uncomfortable doing. And I really appreciate you always being in my corner regardless of what I'm doing. So I want to thank you publicly for this. Um, and thank you for supporting me. I remember I was... I remember I led a Bible study here in Miami. This was months ago now. And it's the first time I was leading a Bible study here in the States. And I invited some people and nobody ended up showing up. So for about 30 minutes, I was at this restaurant and I was talking to one of the staff members about the material that I was going to go through. And all of a sudden you walk in the door. And I remember mentioning it to you in passing about a week before, not thinking that you put it on your calendar showing up, but you show up dressed up, ready to go. And I'm like, wow, like, thank you. Um, and it meant a whole lot to me and it really means a whole lot that you're here right now. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome, babe. Thank you. Yeah. I love you. You know, when you said you were doing your Bible study and it was your first one, Yeah. I mean, I was so grateful to be able to be there. Uh, I'm so proud of you. I love you. I want to give you your flowers as well. Thank you for making me a mommy you know, and, and introducing me to, um, love like I've never experienced before. So I thank you as well. Thank you. And it's an honor to be here. Thank you, mama. So what coach comma is about is helping people show up prepared for every season and every single arena that they may step into. And I love one of the groups that we are focused on serving is the 450 in the NBA with our expert demographic. And the experts aren't just the 450. It's the wives, it's the kids, it's the entire families, because once a player reaches that platform of being amongst the elite of elite in the NBA, their whole family is elevated to that platform as well. That comes with a whole lot. And I would be doing, I would be doing people a disservice not to mention the people who are behind the scenes, manning the fort, holding it down, literally. And you are one of those people and you've done it excellently for years. And I'm amazed at the position that God has put me in to learn from such amazing people, both on the court and off the court. And you're at the top of that list off the court. So I want to hear. But you're just going to make me cry like the whole time. That's why I brought these tissues. That's why I brought these tissues here. And really, the way you and dad met, it's such an interesting story how y'all met in high school. And you can talk a bit about that now and how the career has gone through so many different seasons from high school to college to pros to out of the pros to back in the pros again. And you've been through so much. So I want to hear a bit more about that journey and whatever you care to share with the listeners of the podcast. I would love for you to. Yeah, well, that journey, you know, it, it really is so interesting. And it wasn't a journey that I planned or, um, you know, I, I just felt along the way, every step of the way, including this moment that it has been God. Yeah. You know, your father, as you mentioned, our story was that we met in high school. We were pen pals in high school. You know nothing about no. that. <laughs> we wrote letters to each <laughs> other in high school and that was our way of communicating because long distance calls, it, we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. That was very expensive. So we were pen pals in high school and then happened to go to college in the same city. I went to Howard, the Mecca, as I tried <laughs> to get you to go, but that's another conversation. Uh -huh. And uh, you uh, and your dad, your dad went to Georgetown. Yeah. And so we happened to be in the same city and that's how we started dating during that time. And you're right, it was high school, through college, through uh, the professional, career and it's been an interesting experience i'm grateful for it all for every step of the way um, because again i believe you know that's how we're here and um you know like i said i couldn't have written it mm -hmm. you know i've always believed and 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 thought like god had great things for me in this world and this whole experience like you said there's only a small number yeah. of people that get to experience the, this lifestyle. And um, it was a blessing the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. 
how have you been able to serve people through the game of basketball? Hmm. Well, you know, basketball, because it is going to this level, the professional level, it is such a large stage and it's not just the players that are on that stage, it's families and, you know, so the work that I do in serving the community uh, you know about, and some people may know about Honey Shine, the yeah. mentoring program uh, that I have, that we have. Yeah. You know, it uh, started because when your dad's career, when God brought us back here to South Florida, I used to live here when I was a little girl. Mm. And when uh, basketball brought us back here to South Florida, I would go visit the amazing woman, Miss Annie Lou Johnson, who used to take care of me in the same house way down in Ghouls mm -hmm. where, you know, my mom would come pick me up and I was shooting craps <laughs> across the street at the pool hall as a little girl, uh, you know, I could shoot some dice, you yeah. know, that's what I knew. And I remember us having to get on the floor and get on the ground when they were fighting outside because we didn't know if bullets were coming through the walls wow. or the windows. And that's what I remembered. But when I would go back and visit Miss Annie Lou, I just I was just so happy to see her. She was yeah. a, a, such a blessing, her and um, Uncle Head were such a blessing in my life. And I remember seeing groups of girls walk around the neighborhood and I'd wonder which one am I out of that group mm. had it not been for the mommy in my life mm. or Miss Annie Lou or Mama Rainey, the women in my life. And I know what God had allowed me to see, yeah. you know, in college, growing up in Vegas and, and, and living the life, uh, you know, that God had, had blessed me with. And I had just wanted those same little girls to have that same opportunity. Yeah. Like if they just saw what was up the yeah. street, what was over on the beach, you know, the yeah. hotels and the, the just different opportunities out there, they could do whatever they wanted in this yeah. world. And God placed it on my heart. When people say, how did Honey Shine start? It was God. Yeah. It was God that placed it on my heart Amen. and said, Tracy, that w what you've got to experience, I knew everyone didn't grow up with a mom like me. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I had the best mommy in the world, yeah. the greatest mommy in the world. Yeah. And I'm so grateful for her, but I knew not everyone had that. Yeah. And people would always say, how did you turn out okay? <laughs> Whatever okay is growing up in Vegas yeah. or, you know, growing up and, and having the life that you did. How, how did you make it happen? And it was because of my mom, yeah. you know, and I, I, again, I just thank you for acknowledging me as a mommy mm -hmm. You know, because I know deep in my soul that it's because of my mom that yeah. I am who I am. Yeah, I, I'm noticing that more as I get older and how God has strategically placed people in my life to be able to redirect me and prevent me from going down paths that I'm not meant to go down. And that's only by the grace of God. And I think about how growing up in the city of Miami, when I got to college, I would have friends come down to Miami and visit. And when I come home, Granted, college basketball was a full-time job, so when I come home, I just wanted to be around family. And they would hit me up. It's like, yo, we're going to live. We're doing this and that. And it's like, I'm at the crib. Like, And they would... You may <laughs> see my mama or my dad. You know right, what? Right, right. You know, and I, I go out sometimes too, but it's like, it's funny because I saw Miami in such a different way growing up than most people see it. And having worked in hospitality here with Boucher Brothers and some of the other places that I worked in the city, I'm like, wow, I'm grateful that I grew up in the way that I grew up. And now that I have the wisdom and discernment to help people see the city in a completely different way. Because there's some amazing people down here, some amazing communities down here, and amazing ways to serve. And one of the things that I'm most proud of our family is that we made and are making an impact in the city that we grew up in because yeah. you've never done growing up right and thinking i'm 26 going on 27 this year and you and you and dad got married at, at 27 and you all came to miami at what 25 26 i guess so huh yeah 90 no 26 26 so at my age you got here to the city of miami so 26 at your age yeah yeah yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, married, I think, 28. Yeah. Yeah, you 20, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, I know I'm supposed to hold the mic up, but, yeah. um, you know, 
that whole experience, this is why you never know what God has yeah. planned. And you can't look at your life and compare it to someone yeah. else's. That's where we come up short when yeah. we start to do that. Where if you're thinking like, oh, by this age, I'm supposed to be married or in yeah. a committed relationship or career-wise, that's where we fail when yeah. we start to compare, including to our parents, yeah. including with our peers. Yeah. You know, So I just hope that you don't do that yeah. because it's not necessary. No, it's it, it's not. God gave me a word a while back in Psalm 91. It says that he, whoever dwells in the, in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And what he said to me is, if you're in my shadow, you're not in your Father's shadow. Yeah. Because the plans that God has for me are completely different than the plans that he has for Dad, that he has for you, that he has for Micah and Elijah and and the rest of our family, my teammates as well. And it's so grounding knowing Jesus because it allows me to come back to this place of, oh, like, I'm okay. Like, uh, oh, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, to give you hope in a future. So yeah, it's really And I encouraging. think that's what the, I don't want to, I don't like the term enemy or anything like that, but that's that negativity that wants to introduce you to things like, oh, comparison. Yeah. That's the thief. Yeah. right there that's 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 where you're robbed when you compare yourself yeah. in any way shape or form even if you compare yourself today to yesterday yeah you know or to what you have yeah. what you desire you know in the future yeah. that's a thief so yeah. you know i hope that you continue to remember that because there are some days we remember it very well yeah and then some days we're like oh man like yeah. I should be further along. Yeah. I know I, I've done it myself. Yeah. You know, so as a mom, my prayer is that uh, my children are comfortable in their truth and comfortable where God has them hmm. and, and not looking backwards or too far ahead. Amen. Stay in the present Amen. because this is the gift right here. Amen. Because it's not promise. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, on that point, we've been through a lot in the past three years as a as a family lots of change lots of growth and it's so beautiful that we're able to see god through it all um what you brought up earlier nana nana passed away a few years ago when we talked about this in the last episode and it's it's wild i think it's been been those three years and uh, um being in that season, we were in a transition moving from the house in Pinecrest to um, where you are now. Temporary house. The, and then we were in a temporary house. Yeah, it was three moves in a year. Three moves in a year. And it, it, it felt overwhelming. It's like, why are we moving so much? But looking back, it's like, wow, Like I'm so grateful that God allowed that to happen. Because every step of the way. Every step of the way. Because Nana passed away in that house, and we never have to go back to that house. Yeah. So the whole experience, this is where I know where God is leading us and, and, and hopefully even in this conversation is just to remind people, it's those tough times, they're going to come. Yeah. He didn't say they weren't going to happen at all. They're going to happen, yeah. but it's how you move through it. Yeah. There were days during that time period, 2020, I think it rocked the whole world. Yeah. Um, and I know for me, you know, having to move three times, live in a, a temporary home, live in a hotel, having yeah. to make sure my kids were okay, having yeah. to homeschool, having COVID, having my mom transition like within days of a diagnosis, yeah. you know, and then my birthday, a big milestone, yeah. and then going through a divorce. Yeah. But when I tell you, I, even in it, I've seen God at every yeah. step of the way yeah. because it was God that brought our family together. Yeah. Like we would have never been together had it not been for COVID. Yeah. And it was God like with mommy coming down to Florida. And those of you who don't know my, my mom, Nana uh, lived in Kentucky and a lot, Trey's brother, your brother, Elijah, he woke up one morning. He was like, mom, I'm not sleeping well. I'm not eating well. I just want Nana's food. Mm. She got on that plane days later, came down and cooked all of his favorite things, yeah. then helped me pack, and she wasn't feeling well. This is a woman that lived on 13 acres, cut yeah. her own grass. We just got her to stop 
cleaning her own gutters, took yeah. care of her animals, lived by herself, yeah. ate what she wants, smoked what she wants, did yeah. what she wants, <laughs> all of that. Yeah. You know, but she got on that plane because her grandkids called her yeah. and she listened, yeah. you know, and that was God because she would have been up there stuck yeah. during the pandemic. Yeah. But it was, we were all together. Yeah. So thank you, God. Yeah. So what I have learned through that experience, and I think what we all need to learn through those tough experiences in our lives is to see God every step of the way Amen. because God is orchestrating it all yeah. and it will be used for something great. Amen for our highest good. Amen. This place where I sit right now, this moment in time, thinking back of all that heartache, all that pain, all that yeah. what I felt was suffering. Yeah. But God, it's yeah. so worth it. Yeah. You know, it's so worth it because I see his face. Yeah. And and my mommy transitioning the blessing in that, I miss her every day. Not yeah. a moment goes by that I don't miss her. She's my my ace yeah. but i know in that moment when she transitioned that she as much as i love her as much as you all love her as much as the world loved her in that moment when she went home to glory mm. she had never felt such love in her mm. life mm. and my mother got to feel that mm. ha! Yeah. again i'm the luckiest girl in the world yeah. and then my kids got to be there for yeah. that but God, yeah. that's why I tell you too, like no matter what you're going through, it's not easy. Yeah. You're going to have it, but stay out of here, yeah. you know, and even this, our hearts betray us too. Mm. But when you listen to your soul and your spirit and you're connected to your truth, you can make it through anything, yeah. through anything, yeah. babe. Thank you for that. Um, Thank you. I remember just how everything was orchestrated, like how I ended up in Miami during yes. that time too. We were playing a game in Orlando, had flown down, and then the NBA had shut down their season, and I didn't have to get back on a plane again. I just hopped in a car from Orlando and drove down to Miami, one of the last games of the year. So for all that to line up, and we had all the cousins in the house. We had you, Auntie Lisa, um, Mike and Elijah, like we were all in that place. The dogs together. We together. hadn't been there like that. In no, years. we hadn't been like like it was like a family vacation yes. in a way. And to to see Nana off that way was oh. was really special. We all had our time with her. Um, and wow, it was like this. It's humbling too. Yeah, it it's really it's is. so like God. You love us that much. Yeah, it's really really humbling. It's like you you can't you can't complain because you see His goodness in it all. And uh, man, like even the questions that we do have, it's like you know, he he knows better. He knows why that had to happen. He knows like he, righteous high. Like I remember getting the idea for righteous high in that house, mm -hmm. short like minutes before Nana had actually transitioned. And uh, I remember, <laughs> I remember the last words I spoke to her. All that, and it was just like it was this this peace that surpasses understanding. Yeah. You know, um, this peace that surpasses understanding. And I really know that strength is weakness. How it says in Second Corinthians twelve nine, like, in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. Right. And like, wow, that was such a humbling time. Like, God, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm actually at. And Nana was at that point. And like you said, it's so beautiful to see um, the strength that she had to be in, in her life in, in so many ways to so many different people, she was able to finally be taken care of by people who she's taken care of. Yes. And, and she hated that She part. hated it. She hated it so much. It was, it was so humbling. And I know, thinking back now, like the Lord was in it all and how um, he got her to the point, I believe she's in heaven. I, I know that that getting her to that point and seeing the faith of us, seeing the faith of there's no other option but to believe. Yeah. And it's amazing how God works all things for good and, and, and is still working things for good. So All things for good. Yeah. And then, you know, with mommy, <laughs> mommy's nature was, you know, we talk about God and spirituality and all of that all the time. Yeah. 
And she was, her take on it, I know she believed, she said she believed there was a higher power. Yeah. But she would always say, man wrote the Bible. Man's a damn lie. Yeah. <laughs> like she didn't trust anything from yeah. man. from. But she knew there was a higher power yeah. because she, and, and that's how, what's so interesting is that's how I came to know God by watching how my mom yeah. was loved and saved along the way. Yeah. Like from being saved from this one burning building and this situation yeah. and, and, so many different things I saw as a little girl. Yeah. Like I've always had that that conversation and that relationship with God. Yeah. And I had it even more, even though my mom was the reason we went to church. Hmm. She wasn't the one going down to church. Yeah. She, cause she didn't <laughs> trust them. She was like, they lie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she knew how they treated her uh, and, you yeah. know, and what, how they were doing, yeah. you know, and she would always, you know, say, be careful of the ones that pray for you yeah. because they might be the ones that pray on you. Like mm. she was, she, wow. she knew there were a lot of people yeah. <laughs> that weren't doing right, yeah. you know, but they ran to the church every Sunday, yeah. you know? And so I, I'm grateful for that, but it was because of her that we would have to go to yeah. church. And we even had Jehovah's Witnesses on, uh -huh. so she was going to get us the word one way <laughs> or another, whether she partook or not. Yeah. Yeah. I think she just wanted y'all out the house. <laughs> that too. <laughs> that too. And, uh, it's important to preface for those who don't know Nana. Nana, I posted about it on, on Instagram. It, it's up on my personal page. And before you were born, before Lisa was born, Nana was pregnant with Lisa. Nana was married to a white man and Nana is a white woman or was a white woman and uh, she had her three kids from a previous marriage taken away from her because the courts at the time I think it was either in Ohio or Kentucky it was in Kentucky in, Kentucky. in 64 yeah and the judge says 20 years from now it's not going she married so the reason she was had her children taken away because she moved from Kentucky mm -hmm. to Cincinnati with her children mm -hmm. that's where she met and married my father mm -hmm. and during this time it was against the law for a white woman to marry a black man mm -hmm. and so she was pregnant with my sister Lisa in 1964 and her ex-husband took her back to court to get custody of her children mind you she had taken her children to visit her family yeah. and when she went to pick them up they hid them from her wow. so she never saw them again until she saw them in court wow. and then when she went to court to um, get custody the judge says 20 years from now it's not going to matter right now it's a civil rights matter granted custody to the father the father stands up and says well I don't want them I just don't want her to have them mm. granted custody to her parents because they said they would take them and if she got rid of my sister Lisa uh, they would whatever that meant they would buy her a house and she could have her kids back Mm. So she had never, she's, and I remember, you know, I had never seen my mommy cry my yeah. whole life. I never until, seen her cry either. Until you were born and her, my brother, LV, he was killed mm. in a motorcycle accident, her only son. And that was the son from her first marriage. She was killed in a motorcycle accident and I had never seen her cry. And I said that, mommy, like, I've never seen you cry. And she said that Christmas she lost the kids. She left every tear she had on that tree mm. decorating that tree mm. as she's pregnant with lisa you mm. know by herself mm. you know and i had heard that story before but it wasn't until that moment where i realized i had a child of my own yeah you know and the pain she must have felt yeah you know and that was the only time i ever saw her cry yeah you know and she always had to be the tough woman yeah the tough one in the neighborhood. We always lived in black neighborhoods. She had to be the crazy white woman. Mm. <laughs> that was her way of protecting us. And um, she did a, a, a great job yeah, she of did doing a that. Job. Yeah. A great job of doing that. Like, I, I wouldn't trade her for, like, I. it was just my sister, um, Nana, and I really growing up. We had Blanche, you know, and her on her side of the family, but no one from her family. And even on my father's side, um, we really didn't have family there. So, you know, she was our everything. Yeah. She was my everything yeah. all of my life. And I yeah. used to want to put her in my pocket, <laughs> like just to protect her. Cause yeah. she was older than the other moms, but she needed no protection at all. Yeah. 
it's it's really I just want to sit with that for a second what you're saying not needing any protection at all it's comforting knowing that like I've definitely worried about you sometimes and uh, I learned when I was in New Zealand that there was really nothing I could do in the sense of like New Zealand where I was living is literally the farthest place in the world from Miami so it's like well God's really he has to be in control the control freak left me because <laughs> I, I had no choice I'm halfway around the world so really really learning to surrender that um and trusting God most importantly that like he's going to work out everything for our good and take care of everything and it's really comforting knowing that. Yeah. And so when you mention in New Zealand, I can tell you as a mom that what's comforting for me, like you could go anywhere in the world. Yeah. You, your brother and sister, I want that for them too. But the reason I feel peace with you going to the furthest point in the world is because of your relationship with God. Mm. I feel that if you have that relationship with God and you know whose you are, yeah. you can go anywhere in the world. And that just gave me peace where yeah. I was fine with letting you go to Russia or wherever, yeah. Yeah. you know, because that, that would, there was a peace in yeah. that. And it's really like a seed that was planted because it's, it's been growing over time each place that I've gone all around the world because I'm realizing like, whoa, like this is, this is really up to me. Like my relationship with God is my relationship with God. No, I'm no longer living vicariously through another person's prayers. And as powerful as it is to have a praying mother, Shout out to all the praying mothers out there. Um, it's, I need to say my own prayers. I need to, to cover myself. I need to and cover my family. It's, and my, it's a personal relationship, a personal walk. And it, it's, it's, wow, it's, it's really about trusting that everybody will get there at their right time. And it's taken me a minute to see that too, because I've definitely been one who, trying to push faith on people. And um, I just finished this book called Boundaries. And I absolutely loved it. I cried through the whole entire book. It was amazing. And one of my biggest takeaways from that is that we're responsible to people, not responsible for them. And something that you and I have talked about before too. And it's like, it, I'm responsible for me. I got to make sure that I'm doing the best that I can in, in my walk and making sure I step into places with a full cup so that when I'm with people, I'm pouring out what it is that I already have right. rather than grabbing for scraps. Right. And, you know, with mommy, what I appreciate about her teachings, like for me, like she wasn't, I always felt like she was the most judgmental person mm -hmm. on the planet. Yeah. But if I really sat back and thought about it, she was the least judgmental mm -hmm. because she was like, whatever they want to do, whatever you're doing in your bedroom, that's your business. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people get caught up in that and in, in concerning themselves, Will, with how other people are living. You know, it's like that in the eye, that... Yeah, the that, plank in the eye. The plank in the eye. You know, we're so concerned about how other people are living or what they're doing in their bedroom or what they're, you know, how they're living. It's your walk. Yeah. At the end of the day, no one was able to go with mommy. Yeah. As much as we loved her, as much as we wanted you know, something specific mm. in that experience, you go solo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's your relationship yeah. with God. Wow. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It has nothing. Mm. I can't take my kids with me. Mm. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't have taken my partner with me. Mm. No one. It's you. Wow. You know, and you have to be okay with that. Yeah. But when we spend our time uh, judging or criticizing or concerning ourselves with everyone else outside of ourselves, that's, mm. that's when it gets heavy. Yeah. That's when it becomes a, a load that we can barely bear. Yeah. I, we have our own stuff to work through. Yeah. And when you mentioned how you were working to lead people, you're supposed to lead people, mm -hmm. but you're not supposed to tell people what yeah. to do. But that comes with maturity. Everyone's yeah. walk with their their faith, and you know that, that it's there are steps to it. There yeah. are levels to it. In yeah. the beginning, I remember telling my mommy, "Mommy, you have to pray. Mommy, you have to do this. Mommy, you have to do that." <laughs> she would cuss me out. 
every time yeah. with every cuss word under the sun, you yeah. know. But at the end of the day, it was her walk. Yeah. It was her journey. Who am I to judge her? Yeah. You know, but we just naturally do that. And I think with moms, mm. we tend to, and I can say that for me because I feel like that way with you mm -hmm. and with you and your sis siblings. But I know I was that way with my mom. Mm -hmm. We tend to judge moms. Yeah. With a through a different lens, yeah. like this lens where they're supposed to be so perfect yeah. in every way yeah. because they are moms, and you know we're pretty good mm -hmm. <laughs> most of the time, but we're human, yeah. you know. And yeah. this is where the grace comes in. Yeah. But I feel that as young people, you tend to give that grace more once you've experienced some sort. Mm of uh, maturity, whether it's having your own family, yeah. you know, or, or your own hardships yeah. or experiences, however it comes, mm -hmm. you know, I think you get there eventually. It, it's, for me, it's been doing the work and really stepping back and seeing where I am. Like I, like I said before, I'm 26 and you had me at 27. And to think of myself having oh. a child... Take your time, Trey. To think of myself having a child next year, I don't feel super overwhelmed by it, to be honest with you. Well, good. What I'm I glad you're not overwhelmed, <laughs> but just <laughs> take your time. Uh -huh. um, still thinking about thinking about learning more about you. Like even in this conversation, I'm learning things about you that I didn't know, and being able to do that with somebody I've known for 26 years is really fascinating, and. Uh, I remember some of the conversations I had with granddad before he passed. I'm like, wow, I didn't know about that. And even after he passed, I found like film rolls. He, I didn't know he, he took pictures like on a film camera. Yeah, he used to enjoy that. The same way I shoot on film and thinking like, oh, that could be something that we talk about. That's water under the bridge. Like being able to have the conversation and be curious, be generally curious about why somebody is the way they are is, is really a blessing. And... Another thing I'm learning is like, it's not on me to, it's on me to deliver and ask the question. It's not my responsibility, how they receive it per se. You understand what I'm saying? Like what? Give me like I can ask you a question. I can ask you out of curiosity and in being curious and asking you questions, it's my responsibility to ask the question and present something in the best way possible that I can. It's not my job to receive it. I got to take the person in mind, take their thoughts, their concerns, their feelings in mind, and I present it the best way I can. Understand what I'm saying? Kind of, but like it with receiving it, it's however you receive it. But I feel like if we have uh, our filter, as long as we don't take it personal, yeah, right. I think that's where yeah. we tend to go left is when we take someone's response or approach personal mm. and. That's human nature to yeah. do that because it's like, wait, why are you acting that way? Why are you doing that? What does that mean? But, you know, let's not take it personal. I think that makes life a lot easier. That's hard to do, yeah. you know, because so many things <laughs> are personal, yeah. you know, especially when it, you feel hurt or, you know, pain or neglected in some way. On the topic of that, how have you learned to do that in basketball? So before we sat down, I was I telling you. I used to take you. I used to take you. You better tell the people. I used to take you. Uh -huh. My defense. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? You better tell the people. You stay fouling. <laughs> Whatever. You stay fouling. Um, so you have experience a lot of success in basketball and a lot of loss. And you've seen it in a different way than most people because you're not out on the court playing, but you still have to deal with. But I was in the gym. What was... Kobe say? What Kobe say? I was in the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the gym somewhere. I allowed you to be in the gym oh, somehow. Oh, my goodness. But, um, yeah, how have you learned to – so where I was going with this question, last night – the Heat lost in the NBA Finals, and I teared up. I was, I, I cried, and I wanted them to win too. But I am beyond the days of crying over basketball. Maybe win 
Elijah or you or something, I may get it. No, I'm still not crying. I'm at the point. I'm not crying over basketball. I did that. I had to be the same one when everyone else was crying over basketball or frustrated or angry over basketball. Uh One of us had to keep it together. So you were always the one that was keeping it together. At some point, yeah, I had to get over it a little sooner Mm -hmm. because it was so intimate and so personal Mm -hmm. for your dad. You know, it, that it was took him longer to get through it. Yeah. You know, so if both of us are jacked up because of a loss, mm. then what happens to y'all? Mm. <laughs> you yeah. know, what happens to the rest of the, yeah. you know, we got to. And I'm sure that probably maybe got on his nerves sometimes as it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's always tomorrow. Uh-huh. He's like, get off me. You know, yeah. Now. But. Someone had, you can't, it, when you really think about it, I'm so blessed because of basketball and I know how important it is because it's a big deal. It's a life long journey for yeah. some people to reach that pinnacle. They, yeah. It literally is blood, sweat, and tears. Yeah. I've seen it and I know, I've witnessed, observed what it takes to reach that. Yeah. It's a lot of sacrifice. Yeah. There's sacrifice with family. There's yeah. sacrifice with uh, fun, there's sacrifice in so many different areas to reach there. You can't just go about your regular every day yeah. and just dilly dally to reach that pinnacle. No, it comes with sacrifice. Yeah. So, in understanding that something is going to have to be sacrificed, I decided that it wasn't going to be my family. Mm. You know, it wasn't going to be our our home life. Mm. You know, you still had school to go to. You still had friends and and dances and you know your own basketball so if if we're jacked up over this you know it takes us all this long to get through it then we're jacked up so that was never an option how did you get good at setting boundaries when it came to navigating the on the court being this way being having to maneuver in some of these circles and then stepping into my basketball games where i'm sure you got questions like oh I still get questions yeah. about the heat yeah. or this. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I'd be focused on yours, yelling at your ref, yeah. you know, all in your game. Can't see, you know, just that yeah. was, a, I look forward to that. That's yeah. ex, That was exciting for me. Yeah. Um, but having to be able, I had to leave it there yeah. because I saw how intense it was for your dad. Mm. Your dad did not, he wasn't able to just right away leave it there because yeah. it, he lived it. Like yeah. he, it was literally blood, sweat, and tears. Like yeah. I, as close as I was to the game, I could never imagine, yeah. you know, his viewpoint of yeah. it. Like, cause I wasn't, you know, yeah. I was in near the gym, in the gym, making sure he was able to be in the gym, yeah. but that they're on the court, hmm. you know? So that that's their world. But in understanding that even now, when it comes to basketball, people still think that you take it so personal. Mm. Like you, like it's, it's a big deal. Like I cheer for the heat. I'm a, um, a heat nation for sure. Uh, but I can't, I, I, I got too much stuff to do. I got yeah. kids relying on me, my own kids, yeah. my honey bugs. I have other kids relying on me. Life, yeah. I want to do other stuff. Yeah. You know, so in a way, I hope that was a help in some way, even with your father, like for him to get to a place of being able to balance it, you know, where he took it very personal all the time. That's why he's uh, a legend. Yeah. Um, But hopefully you, you get to a place where you realize, you know what, there's so much more to this. Mm. There's so much more in this world uh, that is happening. And thank God that we have this outlet, Mm. you know, look at it that way, as opposed to, Oh, we're so sad. Now we're going to be sad all summer. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we outside. <laughs> we are not sad. <laughs> um, what advice would you give to your 26-year-old self on draft night? Mm, I was there on draft night. Well, my hair might not have been as big because <laughs> I did have big hair then. Um, no, on draft night, just I think I was pretty present. I think I was very present uh, in that moment. I don't know. Thank God I didn't know what I knew hmm. at that time because yeah. I, I might have ran. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I might not have, you know, hung in there. Yeah. 
uh, so God gives you what you're supposed yeah. to know, but it was it was all a blur. Yeah. Thank God there are, are pictures or videos because yeah. it really is all a blur. Mm. You know, because life goes on yeah. in that moment. Yeah. You know, and then me being uh, a, a graduate of the Howard University, you know, that mindset of looking at the whole draft aspect and how I felt like guys were you know, objects and, you know, yeah. their, how much they weigh, you know, where yeah. they come, their statistics and things like that, you know, certain things of it I didn't appreciate, um, but it's all a part of the game. Yeah. It really is. When did you realize it was a business? Mm, when did I realize? Oh, there are a few opportunities where I, I, moments where I realized it was a business. For sure, uh, I realized it was a business, your dad's negotiations. Because, you know, the char from Charlotte to Miami yeah. and that whole thing, that was eye-opening. Mm. You know, realized, yes, it's a business. And uh, you, they are commodities, Yeah, you know, and, and that's what that is. Yeah. So I think during negotiations, I realized it was a business. When they would lose, I realized it was a business. Mm. Um, when they would win, I realized it was a business. Yeah, there are, are, are different moments where I realized it, biz it was a business, but for sure during negotiations. Because at the end of the day, it is a business. It's, yeah. not, it's not personal. As personal as it may feel, it's yeah. not personal. It's a business. Yeah. These organizations are spending millions of dollars. They this is a billions. billion dollar industry. Yeah. You know, billions of dollars. And so it's about business. And so what I appreciate during that time when your dad played was that I felt like, you know, they carried themselves as businessmen hmm. a, a lot of time. Here, it seems these days, it's definitely more casual, yeah. you know, but there was something about that era, especially that Pat Riley era. Pat Riley was about business. Yeah. You know, you came to look like a, and so looking back now, sometimes you'd be like, why couldn't you relax to wear whatever you want? But it's a business. Yeah. So you, you know, approach it as such. Hmm. What did you learn when dad had his kidney transplant in the early 2000s? Mm -hmm really at the top of his career in terms of performance just getting off of a just getting off of a gold medal and came back and witnessed the birth of of Micah sitting over there on the couch now what was the learning point that you took from that place in his career well in that moment the whole you know it was that whole experience was a whirlwind too because it was like you said, 2000, I was pregnant with Micah. You all went to Sydney, you, Nana, your dad. You all went there to Australia. I wasn't able to go. There was, pre they practiced in Hawaii. It was me by myself home. So I was all in my emotions, yeah. making scrapbooks for <laughs> anniversary <laughs> gifts and all kind of stuff, just all in my emotions. Yeah. And I just remember feeling like I just wanted my mom. I just wanted my husband. I just wanted my baby or something. But it was, I just kept telling myself, Tracy, you just have to, to keep going. And then, you know, when your dad made it back in time for your sister's birth, that was such a special moment. It was like, I felt like through all of it, I'm telling you, Trey, I've, I see God in, in everything, but he made it back right in time. Mm. 20 minutes later, she comes out, you know, waiting yeah. on him all the way from Australia. Yeah. You know, she waited on him. I prayed that she would wait. So, and then for him not to feel well, it was Two weeks later, to the day, within the same hour that your sister was born, that we got the news that he had uh, a kidney disorder. Wow. Kidney disorder. And I remember, I still, that painting, I, I still have it. It was hanging in our room at the time, and it was a, an image of a woman holding a man. Mm. His head was bent down in her arms. And uh, she was holding him, consoling him. And I remember your father hanging up the phone and I'm hugging him like that. And I look up and that picture's right there. And like, it's like a reflection oh, wow. of what we're doing. This is why art, all of that, we've talked about yeah. that before, what you have around you, you, you're to be mindful of. But I remember it was within the same hour that we got the news and I 
was just so like, what's going to happen? Your dad didn't know what was going to happen. They had never ex- had someone his size. Mm. You know, they, I had just given birth. And yeah. I remember mommy was there. Nana was in town. And I said to mommy, I was like, mommy, what am I going to do? Like, they can't tell me what's going to happen with my husband. You know, I just had a baby. What am I, I have two kids. What am I going to do? And she looked at me and she said, you're going to keep going. Like, what would have happened to you and your sister had I given up? Mm. Whoa. Like, that was the moment. I was like, whew. like a, 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 a air just, whew. like, wake it up, shake it off. You got to keep going. Yeah. You know, because I was really like, I felt broken. I, 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 I remember being in the shower even just like crying, like wounded, like, because I'm thinking like, he's not going to be here. Yeah. Like, I'm, I have to do this by myself. Like, wow. what is happening? And so when mommy said that to me, what would have happened to you and your sister had I given up? Mm. It was like, girl, get it together. Yeah. Keep going. So what's next? And when your father had his, when he, I remember we were back and forth between New Jersey and here and trying to make everyday life normal while he played basketball. And I remember the day that he um, went in for surgery. I had such a peace. Yeah. I slept like I had such a peace. I knew he was going to be fine. Like God made it. And there was chaos all around people and relatives and this and that. But I I just knew in my spirit that I had peace about it. And so I knew he'd be fine. I I, basketball was the least of my concern. Of course, he wanted to play more, but I could care less about basketball. I just wanted my husband, you know, and it, so I just had peace about it, and I knew he'd be okay with that. And here we are all these years later. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's it's interesting how that moment has led to so many different things in terms of how I view basketball. And I remember ESPN being in the house at that time when we were in New Jersey and just seeing the cameras. And Coach Thompson came, Coach Thompson came to yeah. do the interview, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, it's just amazing how how it's it's a it's a business and it's a family in a lot of different ways. Like I'm so grateful for growing up in this space and sometimes when people ask me questions it's like, well, you wouldn't really get it. Like it's it's really deeper than that. I can do my best to explain it and I think that is what I'll do through through this podcast and, and through my career in terms of helping people really conceptualize the fact that yo, like when I'm talking about Patrick Ewing or AI and D Wade and like these are my dad's coworkers the same way your dad may have coworkers the same way your mom may have coworkers and mm-hmm. it's just these coworkers are more visible than your dad and mom's coworkers mm-hmm. and then they're like family and they're Uncle like Patrick, family yeah Uncle Dikembe, yeah. you know Dwayne it really is a family yeah. and with just like all families there's dysfunction yeah you know there are layers to that too so that I think that's a whole other conversation but it really is a family like you even saw last night yeah you know it's about the kids like those players i'm sure once they won that championship and they were in their moment and in their emotions they wanted their kids to see that they want their family to see that they bring my baby here you know like i want my kids to to experience this too because as they are at the top Yep. And, you know, they say it's lonely at the yeah. top, you know. So those that are part of that climb, you want them next to you. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. I think this is a good way to end the the recording. I remember shooting hoops during the Eastern Conference Finals in 06. And I wasn't even watching the games. Like me and some of the other kids, we would go in the back and hoop. Shooting back there and... and they win and dad calls me down on the court and one of my favorite pictures is me like just like with the trophy and and him and all that and i remember i ended up getting sick during the finals i remember that i was so so sad for you yeah i i cried i i was i was really sad Uh, i got sick during the finals and uh, you all were on your way to dallas to go to game six and I didn't end up making the trip, and I watched at home, and everybody's so excited. I see little Gary running around in the locker room. Now Gary's an NBA champion. Which I'm so proud. Which is, is amazing, it's too. It's amazing. Yeah. Him, little Tim. Yeah. Like, it really is wild. Yeah. It's beautiful. And, to like, it's, it's, 
I still believe that my time will come in whatever shape or form as a player, as a coach, or executive, whatever it is, to be at a finals and, and experience that. I know it will. And uh, it's just, it, in all of this, I know that God is working everything out for my good. So missing that moment wasn't really missing that moment. It no. was setting me up for something um, that's going to give him more glory. So I really yeah. believe that. And, and we have to stop looking at things because I've done it too. Like, ah, oh, I should have, yeah. should have, could have. What? Such a waste of time. Yeah. And what mommy would always say, you know that. Don't look back because you only get dust, get in, dust your in your eyes. That's it. She would tell me that. And anytime I think of her or think of anything like, oh, I wish maybe I should have done this different. I get dust in my eyes. I get yeah. emotional. I cry. Um, so don't look back. Yeah. You know, and what, what was it? Uh, something I was listening to recently when they were talking about Lot's wife. When I th- Oh, when she looked back, yeah, turned into a pillow yeah, salt. And don't, don't be like that. Don't, that, that's it. Don't look back. Yeah. Because what can you do about it? It's yeah. a waste of time. No, go forward. Yeah. You know, and that's what I tell you too. Like, you can't control or change anything that's happened. That's yeah. hard for all of us. Yeah. But don't look back. It's yeah. a waste of time, and our time is so valuable Amen. and precious, and this is all we have. Yeah. You know, that's what you want to give. Yeah. You know, you can have material things, and, and all of that's wonderful, and I believe God wants us to be abundant, you know, but at the end of the day, it's that time. Yeah. How have you spent your time? Yeah. You know, and if you spend your time serving and glorifying God, whew, feel like you're winning at life Amen. that's why i'm so proud of you thank you mama i love you kid i love you too yeah well thank you for your time thank you and thank you for your time watching this episode and listening to it and god bless you god bless you who's gonna watch this a lot of people hopefully <laughs> okay hi y'all <laughs> i'm so proud of you kid thank you mama. i love you i love you too